the civilization going, like like fossil fuels and other hydrocarbons, are are becoming scarce. The the the, the empires, in their desperation to keep continue to prop up this this fake system, um, find new ways to extract, you know, hydrocarbons. You know, fracking is another example. Mm -hmm. And so, in that desperation, they destroy more natural habitats and more more environment. Um, you did realize with, with the that, that, with the that rapidity. Let me just finish my point with the with the rapidity, uh, with with, a, with with a, with incredible speed. And so, I just find that I can't really reconcile just sitting back and just waiting for the whole thing to collapse, when the system is 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 still finding new ways to 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 destroy this ecosphere it really is 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 it is on our shoulders and our responsibility to bring it down ourselves and so i agree you know this this government has been overthrown already by the corporations the us government has been overthrown by the corporations you know we can't really just overthrow the government we need to we need to stop the corporations i mean i absolutely agree with that um but there's examples uh, current examples of very valiant groups of people who have been able to put their hurt on the, on the corporations on a very real way. Uh, the folks fighting oil extraction in Nigeria are certainly one of the best examples. The movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta, which is a small group of people with very few resources who have reduced the output of oil on the Niger Delta by 30%, sometimes more. And so... Did they use, did they use um, any... were they not violent? Absolutely they not. Uh, they are they absolutely they're they're using everything they have to to actually stop them and 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 they use violence and kidnapping and sabotage and all kinds of different tactics because they had a non-violent movement uh, the non-violent movement of the Ogoni people for many years. Ken Sarawiwa was their leader, and he was murdered by the government uh, on behalf of the corporations. So you know what do you do at that yeah. point when you tried everything else? Mm -hmm. You're going to let the corporations continue trashing what, what are the largest wetlands in Africa, maybe the world right now. And so, you know, they just certainly had enough. But what they have shown us is that what a small group of committed people, well-organized people with very few resources can do. And all of us here in this room have many, much, many more resources than, than these groups in, in the third world. Um, so, you know, I think that... When you look at, you know, the, the example of Mandela is actually, you know, fantastic because they, they certainly build that culture of resistance. They had, they had all the different elements, above ground, below ground, but they understood that they had a, a powerful enemy and that this had to be a serious thing. This was not like, you know, a little game that they were playing. They were certainly fighting for our lives, for their lives. And so I think we have to start thinking in the same way, you know, how do we stop these corporations from completely decimating the planet? These are the tactics that were used in the past. Obviously not working. The balance sheet is certainly higher on the destruction side than on areas of, of wild nature saved. And so, uh, you know, I mean, we can just party until the end of the world, you know, and say like, well, fuck it, you know? We're just gonna like let it all collapse and just, you know, spend uh, this, this little bit of oil that we have left and, you know, drink good wine and eat cheese or whatever, or we can, try to maintain something for our kids and for, and for future generations. And I think a lot of people deep in their heart don't want the ecosphere to be completely decimated, you know. But I think, again, it has to be, you know, something that we take very seriously and that we work towards every single day of our lives. Yeah. Thank you. I want to thank you for the powerful message in your film. Thanks. It's hard to swallow. It's a very tough message um, and obviously you come over in a very authentic dedicated manner to want to create change I find it very hard to accept that to support the arms industry is the way to <laughs> fight this that's I'm really uncomfortable with that um, but my question to you is how do you see the future summit in Rio as being a useful, and do you see it as a useful part of some change round? Do you see that as a, a possible forum 
or are you very cynical? Well, you know, I, I followed, been following the uh, the COP, uh, um, you know, meetings uh, over the past three years specific, specifically, and I did attend uh, the demonstrations that happened in Mexico for the COP16. I mean, when these summits happen, it's it's almost like they've even before they happen, they already declare that you know there's not going to be any any deal reached. You know. Then the solutions that are being touted are something called Red and Red Plus, which are carbon trading schemes, um, which are not real solutions. It's, it's, it's another way of commodifying, of you know, sort of greenwashing the problem. The the, the scientists. The climate scientists have been extremely clear with us. You know what? What we need to do is go to zero, mm -hmm. zero carbon emissions. Not twenty percent, not fifty percent, but zero carbon emissions means only one thing: we stop burning fossil fuels. I mean, look around. Is anything changing? Is, are the corporations like working towards this? Are the governments of the world really working towards this? You know, the, the, the people who have the power and the resources to actually give us a soft landing are not even making a half a step towards that, that uh, uh, post-carbon future. And so, again, it's, it, it's really up to us. We, we really can't, you know, even, even the most supposedly benevolent governments, like, uh, the, government of, like the government of Bolivia, are continuing with oil exploration and oil, like oil extraction and gas extraction and kicking off indigenous people who Evo Morales says he represents, kicking them off their land for, for these sort of, sort of things. And so his people are rising up over there and trying to stop them. I mean, I think that we've played this game long enough. I think we've asked nicely long enough and I think the time for asking nicely is basically done, you know. I think it's really it's time to fight. And Gandhi did say, fight for what you feel is right, mm -hmm. but not to oppress, didn't he? Absolutely. That was his message. Absolutely. Can you be more specific about what you mean by fight, in terms of what actions you would be advocating, what you would be doing, and what you're advocating we would be doing? Yeah, I mean, this is where it gets a little tricky, mm -hmm. uh, speaking in public. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> certainly within... Uh, Within local context, uh, it's. I mean, I don't live here, so I don't know what what the issues that are happening here. Are. But I think it's it's about thinking, thinking strategically and actually doing the things that need to be done to to stop that, right? And so it's hard for me to say like you know you need to do X, Y, or Z, and and not knowing what what's happening over here. But in the end. Mm, give examples. Uh, oil extraction needs to be stopped. You know, how we stop it, we have to figure that out. Uh, coal fire power plants need to be stopped. Uh, hydraulic fracturing needs to be stopped. Uh, oil refineries need to be stopped. Um, I mean, I think you get the point, right? Um, when groups organize themselves, like serious resistance movements or organize themselves, you know, they need to, you know, build the, the infrastructure that's going to support the folks who are going to act extra, extra legally to stop, you know, whatever it is that they're trying to stop or to win whatever they're trying to win. But I think that, um, you know, unfortunately, in the situation that we're in, no amount of voting, no amount of petition writing, um, no amount of protest is going to bring us to zero carbon emissions, which is what we need to do. And so I think that one of the things that uh, Derek Jensen and a couple of people in the film did, uh, Derek Keith and Eric McVeigh wrote, wrote a book called Deep Room Resistance in which they actually have a taxonomy of resistance and basically look at how groups, including the ANC, how uh, groups organize themselves. And uh, I highly recommend that book uh, if people here are really interested in furthering this discussion in your communities. What was the name of the book again? Deep Green Resistance. Yeah. Um, it, it seems to me that the most incredibly effective organizations are the massive, oppressive 
organizations who have shown us what, how to be effective. Mm. And there are many techniques that we could perhaps use, like our language. Creeping into that language is, is the language of oppression. Um, and, and ours doesn't have to be a language of oppression, but, but that language that comes into common use is, is the one, and the beliefs that come into common use are the ones that change the behavior of the people. Places like Monsanto are saying, we're gonna stop breeding what doesn't belong to us, and then we're the boss and we can sell whatever we like. So, you know, there, there are techniques there that, that, are, that are up front that instead of us saying, all, the, all these things are really bad, say, well, what can we learn from this? And a book I've read that has deeply impressed me as a possible way forward is The Fifth Sacred Thing by Starhawk, where a group of people um, chose a, a bit of land to live the way they believed. And um, eventually the army came up the hill to fight them to take over because they didn't want this. And they, they resisted the army by saying, you are welcome here and there's a place for you at our table. And each time a person was killed, they came up, the, the, the community came up to the soldiers who did the killing and said, let me tell you about that child that you just killed. And you know, let me tell you about that tree that you just knocked down. So kind of allowing this awareness to come into the people that had done the atrocity so that so that it was the, the, these little pawns that were doing the fighting for them, it was never the guys making the decisions, um, to just educate them and say, this is what you've just done. Um, and the book is a very hopeful one, and in the end, the, the pacifists win, which makes the change. Um, and I know you're saying that the pacifists haven't won. Uh, well, I mean, that's one of the things you're saying here. But, but for me, uh, that kind of... There was so much hope there, and it, it, it made me think, well, I'll try that. Whereas what, what's happened in this film for me is, mm. it's sort of saying, look, I know this, I know this, I know mm. this, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm waiting to be told, you know, here's a, here's a thing you could try, try that. You know, 